The Jewish association with Wales goes back centuries, and despite once thriving communities dwindling in more recent times, the contribution to Welsh society remains a proud one. I'm Bennett Aaron. I'm a comedian, I'm Welsh, and I'm Jewish. And in this programme, I'm going to trace some of the history, hear about the different traditions, and reflect and taste, quite literally, a slice of Jewish life in Wales today. This is Bennett Aaron's Camry Knish on BBC Radio Wales. OK, so what's a Knish? I hear many of you shouting at the radio. Well, a Knish is a traditional Eastern European Jewish snack food, but more on that later. I promise it will all become clear. Oh, and if you hear the word shul in the next 30 minutes, that simply means synagogue. So then, how far back does the Jewish link with Wales go? Well, the roots can be traced here, way back to the 13th century. But in 1290, King Edward I forced Jews to leave England, and there are no records of Jewish people living in Wales again until the 17th century, around the time of Oliver Cromwell. After that, though, communities did begin to emerge, particularly in South Wales. But it was the Industrial Revolution which really saw change. Jewish people flocked to what became an industrial powerhouse in Wales, the community's numbers swelling further as large numbers fled persecution in Russia in the late 19th century. So, a century or more on, how many Jews live in Wales now? Tracy Cardwell tested people's knowledge in Bangor. How many um, Jewish people do you think there are living in Wales? That's, that's in Wales, 200,000. In the whole of Wales, uh, I'd say between... Four and five thousand. How many Jewish people do they think are living in Wales currently? I would say ten thousand. No, I would say I would say more. I would say like thirty, forty thousand. I guess the whole of Wales. Two or three hundred. Some good guesses there to reveal the actual number of Jews living in Wales today, and to get a greater understanding of their roots. Here's Dr. Kai Parry Jones, author of the book Jews of Wales: A History. The Jewish population of Wales has never exceeded roughly 6,000. There were Jewish individuals living in Wales almost a 1,000 years ago in the medieval period, but we started seeing communities being established from the 18th century onwards. And at that time, up until the mid-19th century, there were a few hundred Jews living in Wales. This number increased significantly in the late 19th century to roughly between five and 6,000. And this number then declined throughout the 20th century. And we now currently have roughly 2,000 living in Wales today. So where did the Jews who first came to Wales live? The oldest Jewish community is in Swansea, and that officially dates back to 1768. And the Jewish population throughout the 18th and mid-19th century numbered in the hundreds. And there were more communities that were then established in places like Cardiff and Newport and also in Merthyr Tydville. But you generally see a growth in the size and the geographical spread of communities towards the end of the 19th century. And there were numerous communities established in the valleys. Why such an influx in the 19th century? Jewish immigrants came to Wales and the UK more generally from places like Central and Eastern Europe, mainly because they were escaping persecution and poverty. But their arrival in Wales was also very timely because this was a period of great industrialisation and urbanisation. Some of the Jews who travelled to North Wales in the 1800s came from Manchester and Liverpool, and early communities were set up in Llandidno, Rhyl and Bangor. Hi, I'm Nathan Abrams. I'm a professor of film studies at Bangor University here in Bangor. But my side interest is the Jewish history of Bangor and surrounding areas. Um, Here we are outside 21 High Street, today the city dental practice. This was the site of Wartsky's first premises. Wartsky's is a world-famous jeweller, and they began here in the late 19th century. From there, moved to Chlandidna and then opened up a shop in London which is called Wartzkis of Chlandidno, and it's still there today. They had very famous customers, like royalty, Ian Fleming. Fleming put Emmanuel Snowman, the managing director, in one of his stories, Property of a Lady. But when it got made into Octopussy, he got cut out. The Wartzkis arrive into the UK from Poland. They initially went to Liverpool. 
from Liverpool, they were peddling in the countryside of North Wales. And as the story goes, Maurice Walsky was crossing the Menai Straits and a man gave him a lift in his carriage and they got to chatting and the man gave him his card and said, if you ever need some help, then get in touch. Now that man, it turned out, was the Marquis of Anglesey and he set him up with Maurice Walsky's first shop. And from these humble beginnings has become a globally renowned firm that still survives today in London. And that example of 19th century aristocracy helping the Jewish community in Bangor is replicated here in Cardiff. I'm John Minx. I'm a member of the Cardiff Reform Synagogue and also of the Jewish History Association of South Wales. And we're here outside the cemetery in Cardiff. Yes, this is one of three Jewish cemeteries in Cardiff. This is the oldest, an Orthodox cemetery. There's a newer Orthodox cemetery a few miles away and the Reform Synagogue has a section within the municipal cemetery. The stone outside it reads, This ground was given for the Jews' cemetery by the most noble John Marquis of Butte, A.D. 1841, A.M. 5602, and it has the names of the officers of the congregation, Mark Marks, Solomon Marks and Samuel Marks on it. So the land was given in 1841, but it wasn't actually used for burials until 1852. Shall we go into the grounds? Yes, I, I have the key, I've been told. To push the door very hard, we should be able to get in. Buried here's Aaron Shepherd, to whom you're related. Yes, Aaron Shepherd was my grandfather's uncle, and he and his brother Tobias were the first members of my family to come to the United Kingdom. They lived in eastern Poland, and they left in the 1870s, Eventually, they both ended up in South Wales. And between the 1870s and the early 20th century, they set up a number of businesses with varying degrees of success. And then in 1913, they created a business which lasted for 80 years called Welsh Glass. My grandparents came from Lithuania to Port Albert. And my grandfather, Ben Aaron, who I'm named after, started a glazing business which my father eventually took over, Charles Aaron, and one of the suppliers for my father's business was Wells Glass. Oh, there you are. And I remember going with him to pick up stock and bring it back to Petorbert. There were Jews who went around the valleys peddling panes of glass. Yes, well, apparently this is more or less how my grandfather started. Right. My father, as I said, he started the business, then my father took over, and I think everybody was disappointed that neither my brother nor I took over the family business. <laughs> but when it comes to DIY, it's not really my forte, to be no. honest. But that's incredible. What a coincidence. We're almost related. How funny. Were your grandparents religious Jews, Orthodox Jews? My father's parents were traditional, I guess. They were not religious I don't know that my grandfather observed the Sabbath, but in those days, more or less everyone in the community kept kosher, and they knew that they could go to other people's homes because they kept kosher as well. And they went to synagogue regularly. At that point, having not long come from Poland, the traditions were still very strong and ran very deep. I mean, my grandparents were very orthodox. I remember hearing the story when... Because they were religious, they couldn't light a fire mm. on Saturday. So every Orthodox family had somebody to come and light the fire for them. And the person who lit my grandparents' fire was a young boy who went along with his father, and it was Anthony Hopkins. Oh, right. A few months ago, I emailed Anthony Hopkins and asked him if he remembered this. And he remembered the story, and he remembers going to my grandparents' house. Right. He grew up with my father, remembers my father very well. Uh, considering Fort Hallwood is such a small place, it's, it's funny how everybody seems to know each other and work together. There's such a lovely community feeling, both Jewish and non-Jewish people helping each other as yes. best they could. So we've heard how the Cardiff Jewish community started in the 1840s. At the same time, the South Wales boomtown of its day, Merthyr Tidville, was also attracting Jewish immigration. Michael Mayle is the chief executive of the Foundation for Jewish Heritage, which is currently working to turn the old synagogue building in Merthyr into a Welsh Jewish heritage centre. The story of Merthyr is the story of the Industrial Revolution. Merthyr was a small village and then through the iron and coal 
industries that developed in Merthyr. It became the largest town in Wales. It attracted migration from throughout Wales and also abroad, and that included Jews who settled in Merthyr in the 1840s. The community in Merthyr at its peak was around 400 plus. And the synagogue that was built in 1870s, it was purpose built and reflected the success of the community within Merthyr. It was highly integrated into the life of the town and many leading members of the Jewish community were also leading members of, of civil society. What were relations like between Jews and other communities in Merthyr back then? There was very good relations with the wider community within Merthyr. There was a certain tolerance that is talked about even to this day, given the diversity of the populations that settled in the town. And the community was quite prominent in a number of ways, you know, a number of lawyers, doctors, the Jewish community was prominent. But while community relations may have been good in Merthyr in the 19th century, anti-Semitism reared its head down the valley in Tredega in the early 1900s. The Tredega riots was a week long of rioting in the Monmouthshire Valleys in August of 1911. Dr Kai Parry jones again. Basically started with the targeting and looting of 18 Jewish shops in Tredega that then spread to other towns such as Ebu Vale and Bryn Mawr over subsequent evenings where, again, other Jewish businesses were singled out for attack by the rioters. And the origins of the riots lie in claims and rumours that certain local Jewish landlords and retailers were charging excessive rents and raising prices during a time of economic hardship. Since 1911 was a period of great industrial unrest in South Wales. You had the Tonopandi riots in 1910, a year before, and you also had the Llanelli riots, which took place a week before. So these rioters, many of them unemployed miners and struggling financially, these Jewish immigrants, who despite having largely lived peacefully with their non-Jewish neighbours for a few decades, were seen as outsiders and newcomers to Wales, who were, in this context, seen to be taking advantage and profiting from the misfortunes of the so-called Welsh native population. It's true that rioters did eventually end up looting non-Jewish stores during the week of rioting. But I do think, you know, there's no denying that the root cause of the Tredegar riots were anti-Jewish in nature. Back in Bangor now, as Professor Nathan Evans continues his historical tour of Jewish gems. This building is being redesigned with the name T. Polakoff House. So again, it's another example where only the name retains the history of the building, but it was another important business in Bangor's life. The Polakoffs also came from Poland, and there were loads of Polakoff kids, and they opened up shops in this part of Wales. Hollyhead, Pocheli, Blaenau Fustiniog. People remember working here, shopping here. They would come to Polakoffs for their everyday clothes, and they'd go to Wartskis for their Sunday best. Together with the Wartskis, the Polakoffs were very important in the life of the Jewish community as well, in terms of helping to raise money for the synagogues and to serve as its honorary officers, both here and in Chlandidna. As there's no synagogue here today, the only synagogue that remains in North Wales is in Chlandidna, but that's not owned by a local community. As the 20th century progressed, Jews began climbing the professional ladder with notable success in medicine, law and accountancy. Stephen Hamilton is from Merthyr Tydfil, and in the 1960s, both his father and great-uncle had highly respected roles in the local community. His father was a GP in Abavan, while his great-uncle was the coroner at the time of the disaster in 1966. My father had a number of patients who were caught up in the tragedy, and he felt he had an overwhelming need to go to the site to see what he could do. He went up with one of his GP colleagues around about mid-morning, but they were turned away by the police because there was so much help that there was no way could they get to the site itself. So that early evening, I went up with my father to the site and I can vividly remember sitting in the car waiting for him in the dark and he seemed to be gone for an extraordinary amount of time to the extent that I thought the tip had further slid and created more mayhem. But 
all he was able to do in the circumstances, sadly, was identify bodies. Despite the Jewish population dwindling across Wales over the past few decades, there are still two working synagogues in Cardiff representing both the Reform and Orthodox communities. Hello, Bennett. I'm David. Welcome to Cardiff Reform Synagogue. Thank you very much. Lovely to meet you. Thank Come you. Come on in. My name is David Cohen. I am the leader of what's called the Executive Committee of our Synagogue's Council. And despite my accent, I've been a member of this community for 35 years now. I grew up in Montreal. I came to Britain as a student, age 21, and I'm 71 now. And how did you become involved with the Reform Synagogue here? I grew up Orthodox, uh, what we call conservative in North America. I married a woman who wasn't Jewish, and my wife converted to reform, and we raised our children here. Um, Have you always been here in this building? It used to be a primitive Methodist chapel. It looks a lot like a church from the outside, because that's what it used to be. Inside, it looks a lot more like a synagogue. The community bought it and moved in here in about 1950, 51. The community started in 48, and this was the first building, and we've been here ever since. And how big is the congregation? How big is the community here? Very small. 150 family members. This plaque, I'm just going to read what it says. This tablet is erected in memory of the relatives of members of this synagogue who perished by Nazi oppression and whose graves are unknown. May their dear souls rest in peace. This was done right at the beginning. The founding members of Cardiff Reform Synagogue, many of them had either escaped themselves before the Holocaust and or had relatives who didn't quite make it. And so they thought it would be a good idea to have this memorial board. It has 102 names on it, just name and the city where they lived. All of those founder members have now died off of old age, and virtually nobody could say who anyone on this board was. And so the Jewish History Association of South Wales got a grant from the National Lottery Heritage Fund to research into these names. And now we know something about every one of them. None of them made it to Wales, of course, but their families are in Wales. And so there is a strong Welsh connection with these people. My name is Louise Fuller, and I am a warden of the Cardiff Reform Synagogue. And it is my job, along with three other wardens, to make sure the running smoothly for our services that take place on Shabbat from Friday evening and Saturday. Obviously, of course, the festivals that we have and one of our main festivals coming up now is our High Holy Days. How busy does it get on the High Holy Days especially? For us now, for us to say we'd have 50 members coming, we'd be very fortunate. Most people will stay for the service for Rosh Hashanah, our New Year. But Yom Kippur, people do come and go. Yom Kippur is the Day of Atonement where we all come together, Jews all over the world, to atone for our sins, sins of the country, and to ask God to forgive us for what we have done throughout the year. We fast from the night before, Kol Nidre, approximately at 7 p.m. in the evening, and the fast ends approximately 24 and a half hours after that. We have the full-blown Yom Kippur service. My name's Karen Coulter. I've been a member of the synagogue for 60 years now. So my late parents were members here, hence I've always been a member. I have three children who have also grown up here. My husband isn't Jewish, but very, very supportive for my religion. Do your children, will they carry on the religion? I think it's a difficult one because I think my children aren't married and I think a lot of it depends if they marry somebody Jewish, then yes, I think they'll embrace it. But if they don't, it depends on their partner and how supportive they are. And in the Jewish religion, the children take on the mother's religion, well, Judaism. So my children, though my husband isn't Jewish, are Jewish. Whilst they'd be welcomed here in the Reform Synagogue, it's whether, you know, his partner will want that. Now, at the start of this programme, I told you I'd literally be taking a slice of Jewish life in modern Wales. Well, the time has indeed come for that Camry Knish. I bake these this morning. Uh, knishes are one of the traditional Jewish side dishes. It's basically a pastry filled with 
various fillings, but I'm told that because Bennett is a vegetarian, I made potato knishes, which is probably the most common. I brought four. I think four should be enough for me. Um, (laughs) Wow, that's disgusting. I'm joking. That's really, (laughs) really tasty. And you made these? Yes. Is it just potato inside? Potato and onion. I have no idea what their history is, but they're basically peasant food. Yeah, lovely. Thank you for that. Hello there. Hi, I'm Bennett. How are you? Nice I'm to Lawrence. Meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank Come you. On thank you. You want to go into the synagogue now? Uh, yes, that'll be lovely. Thank you. Having enjoyed that tasty snack at the Reform Synagogue, I popped into the Orthodox Synagogue at King Coyd, where I met Lawrence Kahn, who is chair of the South Wales Jewish Representative Council. Lawrence told me how Jewish communities first formed in South Wales. The first community was Swansea. Uh, we then came to Cardiff. Well, what happened was that you had the Jews living in Cardiff, and the Jews in Cardiff wanted to have a business, or wanted to be in business. So what did they do? They used to go to the valleys, Merthyr, Aberdare, Mountain Ash, Pontypridd, all these places, and do business up there. What happened was, if you were reasonably orthodox, you went to work on a Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then you went to work on the Friday morning, but by the time to get back to shul, you had to leave lunchtime. So all of a sudden, we've now got eight or nine or ten men, and they formed a synagogue, and they formed a community, and they stayed over. And that's how you had Jews living in in all these places. Merthyr, of course, is famous for having a a most beautiful synagogue that is being reconstructed at the moment. Ray Lawrence is the Orthodox Synagogue Administrator. He's been in Cardiff for nearly 50 years. When I first came here in 76, there was a Jewish butcher, very prominent Jewish businesses around the town, and they go away because they follow their children. So the parents who own the businesses close them down or sell them off and move where the children are. So London is obviously a magnet for these people, and it has changed a lot since then, yes. Mainly the butcher. We haven't got a butcher here anymore, a kosher butcher, so we have to get deliveries from London every four weeks. I remember as a child coming here and getting the orders for Pesach, for Passover, with my parents and my, and my grandparents. But there's a big warehouse And I remember going there and getting that because that wouldn't exist anymore. So things like that, getting food for Passover, that also has to come now from London, I'm guessing. Everything comes from London. There are a few stores that they have counters with Jewish goods on there, but not the quantity that people need. I mean, meats, stuffs, dry foods, most of it all comes from London. With regard to the community here, I'm curious, has there ever been any animosity from non-Jewish people in the area at all since you've been a part of this? It's always been very amicable. Uh, We have an excellent relationship, not only with the local residents, the flats who live just opposite us, but also the police. So you've not had problems since you've been here, really? It's a horrible thing to say no, but we've never noticed any major incidents, no. With regards to the Reform Synagogue Mm. down the road, you all get on amicably and is it like one big happy family with them? We're all Jewish at the end of the day and um, I don't remember Hitler saying that which is reform, which is orthodox when he was sorting sorting the Holocaust people out in the 30s in Nazi Germany. But no, we have an excellent working relationship with them. I was speaking earlier about the numbers dwindling. Is there any way, do you think, of encouraging people to come to Cardiff to try and build up numbers at all? Very difficult because the average age group here is well over 60. And we've all done our part bringing up children here. They move away. They see the bright lights of London and wherever. And it is a difficult situation. We lose on average eight people a year. The numbers are going down. Our numbers here, members, bodies-wise, 140, 150. We do get new members, but not as many as we would like. And you do the maths. We, As I say, we lose eight people a year. In 10 years' time, we'll be down to 50 or 60, possibly. And that is the way it's going to go. But there's no extra people coming to fill the gaps. So you can see in the future that, sadly, there won't be a Jewish community anymore in Cardiff. I think there'll always be a Jewish community. But, of course, the other thing, one doesn't want to get too neurotic, but you're always looking at the political situation. 
This view is shared by Norma Glass, MBE, who is part of the very small Jewish community down the road in Swansea. On a sad note, am I right in thinking this is the first year, apart from lockdown, that there isn't a service for Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur at the shul? Yes, it is. Because we're an elderly community that's left, and we have the problem that many of the men who would make a minion cannot stay the length of the service. This is a very sad moment, although we are now in the process of ensuring that all our records are in the county archives, ensuring that the history and the people of Swansea will never be forgotten. Well, it's been a lovely whistle-stop tour of Jewish life and history in Wales, a lot to take in. To reflect on the things we've heard, I sat down with my producer, Andrew Edwards, at the end of our trip around South Wales. For coming to Knish, we've come to Wallis, which is a bit of an institution in Cardiff. It's been around for many years in many different places and is strongly connected with the Jewish community and the Jewish history of Cardiff. It's uh, an afternoon where we've been speaking to many people in the community. Bennett, what are your thoughts at this point? I just keep thinking about how sad it is, the fact the numbers are dropping. Saying that, you know, I, I myself and a lot of my contemporaries moved away from Wales for work, so I guess I'm part of the reason. And when you think of the numbers that were here and the numbers that came over from other countries and started these communities, it's just sad that the legacy is finishing. However, it's great that these heritage centres are putting so much time and effort into restoring things and holding the memories so that future generations will be able to look back and see what once was thriving Jewish communities around Wales. And I think we have demonstrated you can still get a good knish in Cardiff. You can get a lovely knish. I'm still only halfway through mine. Tasty, but really filling. I might be popping back to see him again in a couple of weeks when I finish digesting this one. You've been listening to Bennett Aaron's Camry Knish. The producer was Andrew Edwards. It was an MIM production for BBC Radio Wales.